thank you everyone for joining us today. Many of you probably already know that Stroudwater is a national healthcare consulting firm. And today you'll be hearing from Louise Bride, who has 35 years experience in the field, Lindsay Corcoran, who has 10 years, and Dr. Michael Parchman with 25 years in the field. Other members of the team include Carla Wilbur and Keith Bublow. This webinar is too large to have open microphones for everyone. So please use the question or chat area and type in any questions that may come up during the session. And there will be a question and answer section at the end. And links to the slides and recording of this session will be sent out after the presentation is done. And so without further ado, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Louise Bride. Louise. All right, thank you so much, Benson, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me add my thanks. Appreciate you all participating and attending our webinar this afternoon. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us right along. Um, so hopefully I can get my slide to advance here. Well, it worked earlier. Okay. Try the arrow key. Yeah, it said uh, it had paused screen sharing for a moment. That means something's in front of it. So if you can get it to the front again and then use the arrows at the bottom, I think you'll be all set. Well, it's definitely showing that it's at the front. There we go. Okay, so our agenda for today, we're first going to take a look at the big picture. We're going to talk a little bit about what is happening nationally related specifically to the opioid epidemic. Uh, then we will shift gears and uh, talk specifically about the development of the sixth building block program, the opioid management program, how that, a little bit about how that came about, and uh, some uh, early clinical trial results. And uh, we are anticipating that Dr. Markle, uh, that Dr. Michael Parchman, I'll get that out, will be joining us here uh, momentarily, uh, who is um, going to uh, discuss that part of the program with us. And then uh, we will end with a discussion about the Stroudwater's uh, new service offering to improve uh, working with hospitals, working with primary care practices in particular to improve chronic opioid management in the primary care setting. We will leave time at the end for some audience questions and for um, discussion, questions and answer. And uh, as, as Benson said, please do utilize the chat box and uh, we look forward to having some additional conversation at the end. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about, oh, first thing, actually, we're going to do a quick polling question. We'd like to learn a little bit more about each of you and the uh, type of healthcare organization that you represent. We had a, a range of, uh, of um, invitees uh, from these various uh, healthcare settings, and so we'd love to know a little bit more about you. Uh, so Benson will run that uh, polling question for us now. And don't have to leave it open too long. Looks like uh, we've got a fairly even distribution between critical access hospitals and primary care clinic provider practices. Oh, and we just got a few others jumping in as well. So I will right. close that down and let you proceed. All right, great, thank you. Okay, so, and that's helpful. We appreciate you responding to that. Uh, so we know, uh, as I say, a little bit more about you and, uh, and who, you rep who you are from or who you are with. So a little bit more about the background of the U.S. opioid epidemic. We've all been hearing in the news actually now for a number of years about the, uh, the situation of a, an epidemic nationally. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate or have, have indicated that there has been an increase in the United States of an almost six times increase in the number of prescription um, opioid-related uh, overdose deaths. Uh, from 1998 uh, through uh, the present. So really a very significant uh, increase over, these, over this period of time. And sadly, the number of overdose deaths has continued to climb year over year. Um, in most, the most recent data um, is um, showing that there's been uh, a further spike year over year from the 2018-2019 time period to 2019-2020 uh, with an estimate of 81,000 Americans uh, who died of a drug overdose death in that time period. Um, and as you see, mainly synthetic opioids have been um, the driver of these um, drug overdose deaths in the most recent time period. 
my screen keeps disappearing on me here, so let me see if I can get it back. Um, and um, a, a comment about who is at risk. And this honestly, uh, seeing this in, in black and white in the literature uh, really was kind of um, a stark reminder to me. Anyone who uses opioids for long-term management of chronic pain is at risk for opioid overdose. So examples of individuals who often receive an, opi an opioid-based pain medication, it may be a student athlete, it may be a teenager who's had their wisdom teeth extracted. It may be an adult of any age who's experienced an, an, an injury or has um, uh, had surgery for any number of reasons. So teens and, age, and adults of all ages are at risk for um, an opioid overdose if they remain on longer-term opioid therapy. Uh, this graph is showing um, with the various um, uh, types of opioids showing age-adjusted drug overdose death rates. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, really looking at the time period, the literature is commonly looking at the time period from 1999, and this, this slide carries us up through 2018. Um, and as you can see, particularly that the dark blue line, the one that you may be able to see is labeled synthetic opioids other than methadone has had a really sharp increase over the last um, five to seven years. Uh, there was a slight dip uh, at, from 2017 to 2018 uh, for, um, uh, for the natural and semi-synthetic opioids, uh, but unfortunately that trend did not continue. And the most recent data, 2018, 2019, 2020, um, those, those um, trends have continued to climb again. Or really, I should say, resume the climbing again. There has been a growing recognition of the impact of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, you may have heard the terminology. Um, it's been in the news. Call, um, some, um, um, some commentators are describing it as the epidemic within the epidemic. Uh, unfortunately, again, preliminary data showing a really significant spike uh, compared to the prior 12 months of um, overdose deaths, uh, which is being attributed uh, in part directly to the, um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you see the quote there from the um, Attorney General in Maine. It is clear from the data that the increase in deaths from the opioid epidemic can be partially attributed to the increased isolation that folks are experiencing while going through this um, epidemic. Some of the other specific uh, comments in the literature about this, uh, this, this, this circumstances is that the disruptions in the ability of individuals to access um, therapy services, to access um, MAT treatment, all of which have had a real negative um, impact on, uh, on the um, overdose rates. Um, This is another statistic that I think is really important and is very relevant to our discussion today. Um, again, CDC um, estimates or has data that has indicated that three out of four people who used heroin misused a prescription opioid first. Uh, that was a shocking statistic to me, and I think um, it, is, um, it, it really underscores why we feel it is so important to talk about this topic and particularly to talk about it in the context of primary care and primary care delivery in the United States. Um, and we'll say more about that in just a moment. Um, this does bring us up to our next polling question. And so I'm going to um, pass it again to um, Benson. We want to ask a little bit about your um, understanding, your knowledge of your patient population in regard to long-term opioid therapy for non-cancer pain. And it looks like the overwhelming majority are not sure, but there appear to be uh, quite a few others in the 10%, but less than 15% category, so. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay. So 
So let's talk a little bit more about prescription opioids. Again, this you may be very um, familiar with this information. Um, I thought we would spend just a moment to talk a little bit more about prescription opioids, thinking about that last statistic that I had just mentioned about three out of four heroin users um, started with a, a prescription um, opioid first. Um, prescription opo opioids, as, as you all know, are used uh, to treat moderate to severe pain. Uh, we've already I've already touched on the fact that they're very commonly utilized following accidents, injuries, postoperatively. Um, there has been a dramatic increase in the use of prescription opioids for non-cancer pain in recent years. Uh, back pain, neck pain, uh, joint pain of uh, you know knee pain, uh, which are so prevalent in our population, and uh, for which in recent years there's been a, a growing increase in the, um, the, the number of, of um, prescriptions, of, of, of opioid prescriptions. Um, and a quick look at the list, um, hydrocodone, oxycodone, codeine, it, it's somewhat easy, I, I found for myself in the past before really delving into all this, to not even really think about those as being opioids, but they are opioid-based medications and very commonly utilized pain medicines. And so again, that really underscores why it's so important to, to um, be really focused on this issue. Um, there are, uh, there's considerable data available. The CDC does collect and report on opioid prescribing uh, rate data. Uh, the most recently available data is um, 2019. And as you can see, um, there's wide variability across the United States. Um, in terms of the um, rates at which um, providers are prescribing opioids, the national average in 2019 was 46.7 prescriptions per 100 people. Um, the, interestingly, the prescribing rate actually peaked and leveled off earlier in uh, 2010 to 2012 and has been declining since then, but unfortunately, the amount of opioids um, as uh, measured in morphine milligram equivalents prescribed per person is still approximately three times higher than it was in 1999. And that does correlate with that um, graph that we just looked at showing that steady rise in overdose deaths um, since 1999. Uh, and there is a growing body of evidence. And this is, this is another, I guess, key takeaway that I hope you will um, remember from this from this presentation today, and that is that there is a growing body of evidence that demonstrates that long-term opioid therapy is actually not effective for chronic pain, and the, um, uh, on the other hand, the, um, the risks associated with long-term opioid therapy increase over time and uh, increase the potential for overdose and potential death. Um, chronic pain is defined as pain lasting more than three months or past the time for normal tissue healing. Um, and so um, the fact that there, and there's a large number, again, the CDC is estimating that at least 11% of the U.S. population may be um, dealing with chronic pain on a daily basis. Uh, this slide is just showing that rate map, that, that um, dispensing rate map. Um, and so those of you who are from various states can take a quick look and see where your state falls in that prescribing rate, um, again, looking at 2019 data. Um, the deep orange represents the state with the highest dispensing rate in that time period, and that was Alabama, as you see. Uh, we want to touch also on a, co a very um, common um, comorbidity, and that is um, the combination of individuals dealing with substance use disorder and mental illness concurrently. Um, and as you see here, 7.7 million, um, million individuals, million adults in the United States um, had um, co-occurring mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, this is 2017 data. So it's a little bit dated, but it certainly gives us a real sense of what that, um, what that looks like. Of the um, individuals who were identified at that time as having a substance use disorder, 20.3 million adults, almost 38% also had a concurrent mental illness diagnosis. 
flip side of the coin of the 40, just over 42 million individuals with mental illness, it just over 18% had an, a substance use disorder. So it really underscores how important it is that um, primary care providers are in working in a collaborative and a coordinated way with behavioral health providers to really serve this, um, this population who are dealing with both, both disorders. Um, drug addiction, I'm going to say just a really quick word about that. Drug addiction, drug addiction is um, now uh, clearly identified as a chronic but treatable medical condition. Um, and there are effective medications that do exist to treat opioid use disorder. Uh, one of the huge concerns is that these medications are available but are not very well utilized to treat substance use disorder and opioid use disorder specifically. The CDC has estimated that over 2 million people have an opioid use disorder, but only 20% receive treatment. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has really, in recent years, tried to begin to address um, some of these concerns. They did pre uh, come out with a five-point strategy in 2017 that you see here. Uh, better addiction prevention treatment and recovery services, better data, better pain management, better targeting of overdose reversing drugs, and better research. Um, and so there's a national push to really try to get arms around this ongoing opioid epidemic and to begin to find ways to address the problem. In 2016, the CDC published um, one of the first comprehensive guidelines that specifically address um, chronic pain management and um, opioid and provide opioid pres prescribing guidance. Uh, they they ad identified 12, um, uh, a group of 12 uh, recommendations. And what you see here listed on this slide really are uh, the, the, 12, um, the 12 sets of recommendations. Uh, screening for and offering treatment for opioid use disorder are combined um, in the CDC guideline itself to give you the 12. Um, what is particularly uh, uh, noteworthy is, again, calling out explicitly as part of the guideline, avoiding concurrent opioid and the benzodiazepine prescribing. The, the benzodiazepine Valium and Xanax would be two examples of that, again, commonly utilized and commonly prescribed medications uh, for anxiety and insomnia and uh, uh, sleep, sleep disorders. Um, and we, um, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the um, guideline, the CDC National Opioid Prescribing Guideline, in the context of the Six Building Block Program in just a few moments. And I think this brings us up to our next set of polling questions. We actually have two polling questions here, and uh, these will uh, address uh, what has happened in your organization as it relates to developing and adopting a policy regarding long-term opioid prescribing for, for your patient population. Uh, so Benson, let me let you take that away. And uh, we've, we've got it out. <laughs> uh, we don't have many people answering this one, so I'm not sure whether the uh, doesn't apply is not being utilized or what's going on. But, uh, oh, okay. wait a minute. Okay, now we have a uh, large group of people coming in saying yes. So that's good because we can close this poll and then lead us right on to the final question, which is if you answered yes, can you tell us a little more about the policy? And I'll let you explain that. Uh, yes, thanks. So we, yes, this is a two-part question. So we were interested in knowing, does your organization have a policy that addresses long-term opioid prescribing, uh, particularly for chronic pain? And if so, then is your current policy consistent with the CDC opioid prescribing guideline that I just touched on a moment ago? And, uh, and so we're interested in knowing, is that a guideline that your organization has adopted? Um, if so, are you, are, are, has that been incorporated into day-to-day -day, um, operations from a policy and procedural standpoint, um, or perhaps you're utilizing other guidelines and not the CDC? So that's really what we're interested in learning a little bit more about here. 
And I can close it down saying that most people aren't sure, but the ones who are say that it has been reviewed and updated recently. All right, terrific. Well, good, good, uh, good for those of you who are in that uh, in that category. All right, so we have talked now about um, kind of the big picture, what's happening with the um, in terms of the the progression of the opioid epidemic, and talked a little bit about prescribing of opioids. Now, what we'd like to do is shift and talk specifically about the six building blocks opioid management program. Um, that program was. Um, uh, developed um, specifically really to, to provide an evidence-based quality improvement roadmap to, it's really focused specifically on primary care providers. And the goals are really to um, help to implement consistent, effective, guideline-driven care. Uh, again, the focus really, uh, the recommendation would be particularly to pay attention to that CDC prescribing guideline we've just looked at and talked about. And again, specifically focusing on chronic pain patients other than cancer patients on long-term opioid therapy. This program was developed by a team from the University of Washington Department of Family Medicine, together with folks from the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute, uh, supported by federal and state funding. And um, their work led to the development of this program, which has since then been adopted by um, and integrated into the implementation package for the 2016 uh, CDC guideline that we've been talking about. And it's also been more recently um, incorporated into the Institute for Healthcare Improvements uh, resource toolkit, again, really focusing their toolkit, focusing in particular on improving opioid and pain management. Um, so we're um, very delighted to have with us today uh, an individual from the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute, Dr. Michael Parchman, um, is a senior investigator at the McCall Center for Healthcare Innovation at the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute. Dr. Parchman co-led the team who developed the Six Building Blocks program several years ago, and so we are really delighted that he was able to join us today. And I am going to now turn this over to Dr. Parchman and let him talk with you a little bit about the development of the program and, um, and what some of the early findings have been from that work. Uh, Dr. Parchman. So, thanks, Louise. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yes, I'm um, so, fine, thank you. So I've discovered that I am go to webinar impaired. Um, I didn't realize that until this morning. You can see my name next to my face is Louise Bird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is not correct. Um, so it's, it's great to be here. I'm a primary care physician um, uh, with with 30 plus years, as you can tell by tell my, my gray hair of practice and uh, uh, improvement experience. Most of my life has been spent working on improving uh, management of chronic illnesses in, in primary care settings. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of the background behind the six building blocks program and the change package that, that it, it consists of, it was discovered serendipitously. Um, the serendipity um, was that we were employed by the Robert Johnson Foundation uh, a number of years ago to go out and find and identify very high performing primary care teams across the country and discover what their secret sauce was. What was the secret sauce behind high performing primary care teams? And we began to recognize after the first three to four site visits we did, and you can see this map, this is all the places we visited. We visited each site for a week in person to figure out what they were doing. After the first three to four sites we visited, we began to recognize that all of them, all of them had done something around improving the way they manage patients with chronic pain, um, especially those who were on opioids long-term for their chronic pain. And we began seeing some similarities in their journey in terms of, of how they got to this point and similarities in the way they had made changes within their clinic systems to improve care for patients with chronic pain. And so we began paying very close attention to what they were doing um, uh, and, and figuring out what they were doing in common and that's where the six building blocks actually came from. Um, so I don't see the slides moving when I hit the arrow button. Oh, there we go. Um, got it. Got it. So 
So we actually published a report on this um, in the Journal of American Board of Family Medicine um, uh, a few years back on um, what they were doing in common, what the clinic redesign looked like. And we synthesized them into kind of six areas of work um, or the six building blocks um, and tested that model in a study. Um, we got funding from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to actually study this model. We enrolled 20 rural and rural serving clinics in the Pacific Northwest um, and provided them some external support um, for up to 15 months um, uh, using the, the six building blocks um, change package um, or, or model of support. Um, each clinic created an, a QI team um, we hosted a kickoff visit in each clinic to kind of figure out what's going on, the baseline assessment. Um, we provided then monthly shared learning calls. Each clinic had a uh, assigned um, external practice facilitator or coach. And, um, and then they were offered the opportunity to actually then bring more complicated patients in to present, present them at the University of Washington's telepain program um, as an extra added bonus resource. So next slide. Um, and this is what we saw happen. <clears throat> this is over the course of the study. Um, and you can actually um, go to the, the second publication and actually see the, the, the statistical analysis and the significant uh, test of significance. We had a control group um, that we compared this to. We saw both the total number of patients who were on opioids long-term, the chronic opioid therapy, COT, as we called it back then, we saw that numbers steadily decline um, throughout the intervention. And we also saw among those who continued to be on opioid, the portion who were on higher dose opioids continued to decline as well um, throughout the study period. And both those trends were significant when compared to the control group of clinics um, over the same time period um, in terms of what was going on in their clinics with uh, opioid therapy uh, for, for patients on chronic pain. But I think the next slide uh, for me personally um, is, is one of the things that um, uh, I, I sort of did my happy dance about um, when I saw this, um, which is the people who worked in the clinic would, would say things like this uh, over and over to us, um, that having some sort of plan, having some sort of pathway, and the fact that we're all on the same page about this in our clinic significantly lowered our stress levels. It improved the quality of our work life when we're in the clinic. Um, we, didn't, we didn't dread coming into clinic and seeing these patients like we used to. Um, next slide. Um, and they would never go back to doing the way it was done before. Um, um, so here's just some additional uh, statements um, about uh, what happened. And they were surprised at how little pushback they got from the patients. Um, they were really anticipating that, that this would become a kind of an emotionally charged issue um, in their clinic. And, and they didn't. Um, um, they, they just almost never did. Um, in fact, they really saw patients coming in and thanking, thanking them for, for helping them. Um, with, with improving their chronic pain and their quality of life. And many of their patients, as they tapered them, said, you know, my pain's no better or worse, but boy, my quality of life has much improved. And it was very satisfying. It was just very satisfying for the clinicians and the nursing staff um, and the medical assistants and the front desk staff, everybody who did this work. So next slide. All right. So, Michael, thank you so much. Um, sure. And yes, and I, in, in reading through some of the articles, I, I was also struck by um, some of the other, I think, unexpected results. Um, and that is that patients, uh, as they as they were involved in working with the, the clinical team in in this six building block program, that the patients recognized and and started to wean themselves off of the opioids, and that that was another. Yeah. A component, and I don't know, Michael, if you want to speak a little bit more to that, because that I that really struck me 
and I thought that's that's even better because then the individual they've they've become more knowledgeable <laughs> the patient, yeah. and they're able to take charge of, of kind of their own circumstances. Right. Yeah. As, as clinic teams got engaged in doing this work, and especially as they sort of looked at their policies and revised their policies around opioid prescribing and how they manage chronic pain and developed a consensus about it. And the conversations that the clinic staff had among themselves translated then into revising their patient agreements. Um, the, the kind of the, the opioid, um, what we used to call the, the opioid contract or agreement with patients. Um, and that turned into actually um, almost like an informed consent process, but it was, it created an opportunity for conversations with patients that they hadn't had before when they revised their patient agreement form. And it, you know, it turned into a, into a document about, um, here's what we expect from you as the patient in order for us to continue prescribing this medicine safely. And here's what we promise we will do for you. Um, this is our role um, in taking care of you. Um, and and it caused it caused a whole different level of conversation with patients about why they were on opioids, um, what the safety profile was, and they started seeing patients um, self tapering um, off their opioids, and we're we're surprised at how often that happened as well um, during that process. Um, th thank you. Um, that that is really um, great. Great additional feedback. So that brings us to a little bit more discussion about what are the six building blocks. And uh, these next two slides, uh, we will share with you what those six building blocks are. Um, Michael's already just touched on that block number two. Um, but uh, very quickly, there are a total of six, uh, as, as would be evident in the name. Uh, the first is leadership and consensus. And it just once again really underscores in any healthcare organization uh, that is contemplating uh, a major um, clinical initiative that it, how important it is to have senior leadership, executive level leadership support and buy-in uh, for that undertaking. And in particular, uh, physician um, leadership and physician um, uh, support and buy-in uh, in order to, to successfully um, move, move ahead um, with this sort of an initiative. Um, Dr. Parchman's already touched on block, building block number two, uh, which really gets that uh, very clinically operationally oriented, um, the six building block program. And so building block two is foundational, I would say, and it is really looking at what are the organization's policies, procedures, workflows, uh, the patient agreements, as Dr. Parchman has already touched on, um, and looking um, intentionally at all of that. Uh, body of work and identifying the gaps and then really beginning to develop uh, some consistent standardized um, processes uh, and tools and workflows to support uh, better quality of care and um, opioid prescribing uh, activities um, to care for this um, challenging chronic pain patient population. So in, in organizations who decide to go down this path and, dis and decide they wish to begin to implement the six building block program, it really typically begins with a focus in these foundational areas. Uh, the third uh, block is tracking and monitoring patient care. And so, and that's really a cornerstone of, of a population health approach to, to care delivery. And that is really identifying who are, in the, who are the panel of patients that are uh, chronic pain patients on opioid therapy, and then beginning to be able to track and monitor those those individuals and be proactive in ensuring that they're getting in for regular um, uh, office visits or tele telehealth visits during uh, the era of COVID, uh, that there are regular assessments being done of, of pain control and so, so on and so forth. And then the, um, the next set of, um, the, the second set of building blocks, um, blocks four, five, and six, uh, planned patient-centered visit. So again, being really intentional about uh, being prepared for, doing pre-visit planning, uh, know, knowing when the patients had their last lab work done, are they due for a urine drug screen, all of that being done in an organized and planned way to make the most of the patient visit. Uh, and caring for complex patients uh, becomes really important. We've already talked about um, particularly the individuals that have the comorbid morbidities of opioid use disorder and behavioral health um, needs. And then the sixth block at measuring success. 
Uh, so the, the recommendation is to for the organization that's uh, embarked on implementing the six building block program to set some metrics that will be ways to quantify um, the progress being made and to demonstrate improvement. Uh, the CDC has published a list of 16 uh, relevant metrics uh, specifically around uh, opioid prescribing and uh, managing patients with chronic pain. Um, and we've, uh, and, and Dr. Parchman's really already touched on two of them in, in, the, in uh, when he shared the results of that early, earlier study. Um, the key to re the metrics could be that to start with would be uh, monitoring the total number of patients on long-term opioid therapy and looking at that change over time. And then also looking at what, what kind of numbers of patients in your population are on high dose um, opioid therapy. Uh, because the higher the dosage is, the greater the risk for negative outcomes, the risk for overdose and potentially death. So those are would be two examples of important metrics to measure um, in embarking on this sort of an initiative. And I think with that, uh, Lindsay, I am going to turn this over to you and um, take it from here. Great. Thanks, Louise. Um, so now that you've learned about what the six building blocks are, um, we want to walk you through Stroudwater's, some of Stroudwater's service offerings um, related to the six building blocks. Um, the first one is around um, a webinar series, and we have um, a a standalone webinar um, that we can give that really provides some introduction, high level overview um, of the six building blocks program. Um, or um, the, it could be a webinar series that goes more into depth. Um, and it's a series of four webinars that really build upon each other um, with, the, with the end webinar being around the implementation. Um, these webinars are really designed for clinics and practices um, as well as quality leaders. Um, and, and we really wanna get um, kind of that foundation built um, for y'all. So we have a webinar series that we um, offer. The next set of um, services is around implementing. So if your organization decides, um, you know, this is something that we wanna move forward and we, we feel that we would like to um, need assistance in the implementation of the six building blocks program, Stroudwater can certainly support that. Um, we have, it, within our implementation services, um, we have a phase one approach, which includes really looking at your current state um, of, your, of your organization as it relates to chronic pain and opioid therapy management. Um, we will hold interviews with um, key stakeholders um, to get a better um, insight onto, into um, current operations. And we'll look at um, gaps in, in your, your current practices um, and relative to kind of best practices um, for that management of that subpopulation and provide um, some recommendations for improvement. In addition, um, that phase one also um, supports the education component and really so bringing um, key stakeholders up to speed on the six building blocks program. So we provide that, that high level overview. Um, identifying and sharing resources. Um, the six building blocks um, program has, has brought to, together a, a wealth of, of various resources that could be applicable to your organizations. Um, and that's an opportunity for us to be able to, sh to share some of that information with you, as well as um, facilitate an action planning session um, as it relates to the implementation and, and the development of an implementation action plan. And the phase two of the implementation services is really the um, ongoing support for um, implementation. So through coaching, um, and, and that can be done on a, on a virtual um, platform. Um, uh oh, everything's moving. So, um, you know, really, what, uh, there's, you know, the, the clinical value proposition to implementing the six building blocks program, um, but there's, a, there's some additional um, benefits of improving your long-term opioid therapy management within your organization. Um, one, of course, is around the patient safety and quality of care, um, as, as Michael had 
um, shared with you all that the studies have shown that you know there's that reduced number of patients on on those long-term chronic opioid therapy um, and reducing the risk of a patient um, that may overdose or or die from the misuse of opioids. Uh, in addition to um, reduced hospital readmissions and ED utilization, uh, we'll go over some statistics from the um, CMS's chronic care management um, related to um, ED utilization for that um, population, but we have seen um, potential benefits from reduced readmissions and ED utilization. Lindsay? Can I add one more potential benefit? Of course. Oh, here, I might turn my camera off. Um, <laughs> we also saw more than half of the sites that participated with us use this as an on-ramp to think about and to actually begin a medication for opioid use disorder program in their primary care setting. Because once the providers and staff became comfortable in getting their arms around this patient population in their clinic, um, and began working on improvements, they began to recognize that they had patients with opioid use disorder that they hadn't recognized before. And they began to recognize their responsibility for treating OUD as a chronic disease and not trying to hand that patient off to someone else to do that, which they knew was likely to fail. So this served as an on-ramp for those clinics to get involved in, in that aspect of uh, um, uh, treating uh, OUD. Sorry to interrupt. No, great, great addition. Thanks, Dr. Bartman. Um, so looking at the 21 um, Medicare chronic conditions, um, you'll see that drug abuse and substance abuse um, is, is less prevalent, but if you look through the per capita spending of that, um, that population, you know, it starts to, to move up um, in within, but from the uh, chronic care conditions within the chronic care condition continuum. Um, and you'll see that the ED visits um, have, it's the top um, Medicare chronic condition of the 21. And these are just for, of course, Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and, and then again, hospital readmissions, it is, is the top three, um, drug abuse and substance abuse is the top three hospital readmission. In addition, um, there's some additional potential benefits of improving the long-term opioid therapy um, management within your organization. If you are, you're, if you are participating in MIPS, um, the 2021 improvement activities um, that include high activity weightings um, would be uh, relevant. Um, the relevant activities including the consultation of the prescription drug monitoring program, uh, patient education, and then the use of the CDC guidelines that we um, just went over. So um, it, if this is of interest to you, if you are participating in MIMS, there is a, a, certainly a, a correlation and, and a potential benefit there. Um, in addition to the leveraging the chronic care, Medicare chronic care management and complex um, uh, CCM programs, uh, drug abuse and substance abuse, is a um, applicable diagnosis for those, those management programs. And, I and this um, here is your um, Stroudwater Six Building Blocks team with our, all of our relevant contact information and our guest presenter, Dr. Parchman. So I think that brings us to um, the Q&A session. Did we have another? We didn't have another polling question, right? No. That's correct. We, we do not. We are, okay. we are ready for um, audience questions. So please feel free to use the chat or question section to type in your questions. We have had one that's come in already. And so the question was, how much time and effort will this work require of us? Sort of the, what's the other side of the equation? <laughs> so, Louise, Lindsay, Carla, anybody want to take a run at that one? Uh, yes, sure. And I would love, um, uh, Dr. Parchman, for you to uh, weigh in on this as well. Um, 
Yes, I think uh, as as you begin to familiarize yourself yourself with the um, the specifics around beginning to implement the six building block program, uh, one of the specific recommendations uh, right out of the gate is that uh, the organization identify a team uh, who will be the the leads in uh, beginning to to do this work and to uh, mm -hmm. to really work hard to find some dedicated uh, time for that team to be able to meet and, and uh, begin to work on the identified priorities. Um, we already have talked about uh, one of the steps to, that Stroudwater facilitates, um, but that is really important for the organization <laughs> to do, and that is after you've really evaluated current state and you've identified the gaps in relationship to the, um, the elements of the six building block program, and in particular, as it ties back to those 12 recommendations from the CDC around op opioid prescribing uh, for this population, is to really prioritize and identify your action plan to begin to do that work. And so, um, it, it, it does take time to, to do that and to really um, lay that groundwork, uh, and then to begin to work as a group to achieve consensus. So if there's a need to update the patient agreement, that that would be a priority, uh, perhaps um, an organization to work working with right now, um, they didn't really, they didn't have um, um, very many policies and procedures in place. So they're, and they're trying to develop a standardized um, pain patient visit template that would capture some of these key pieces of information that they know they really need to be addressing at each patient visit. So depending on what you identify as your priorities, then from there you can really begin to develop those action plans, make assignments, um, schedule you know, a time frame, and, uh, and begin to do that work. I think one of the things that I particularly really value and appreciate about the Six Building Block Program is it's very concrete. I mean, there are a whole set of very concrete, practical action steps that can be identified that you, you know, organizationally can begin to work on. And the key, I think, is to really prioritize. Um, but then it definitely does take some commitment of time to, to accomplish that work. Um, Michael, do you want to add to that, uh, given what your, um, your team, as you've done the development work, you, that your team has experienced around that piece of it? Yeah, I was going to add, and just to reemphasize, the nice thing about the program is this flexibility, um, and it can be adapted to wherever you are on your journey. A lot of places have already done work in this area and are fairly far along the path um, of making improvements in this area, but they've identified some areas where they know they continue to need to do some work. Um, <clears throat> so it depends on how much work you want to do and how fast you want to do the work. Um, most of the time we say it takes the QI team uh, meeting at least one hour a month to continue to maintain momentum. And in between the QI meetings, someone has to be working uh, on the efforts to make the change happen. Um, that usually is two to three hours at least a month of someone's time uh, to continue to move the ball forward. Um, as you all know, um, getting primary care clinics to change um, anything um, can be a challenge. Um, and so overcoming that resistance and engaging with the stakeholders in the clinic around making change is important. Um, uh, and that's work. I mean, it takes time to have those conversations. Um, and that's the key. The key is to make the time to have the conversations, um, whether it be in the QI team, whether it be in the monthly staff meetings, um, whether it be in the morning huddles um, in the clinics, taking time to have those conversations about these patients and how you're going to do things differently. Um, so I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but yeah, it takes time and it takes effort to do this. And you have to sort of make it a priority or else it falls off your radar scope um, and nothing changes. We've had many clinics that have started down this path. They revised their policies and then they never implemented them. Um, it just fell off their radar scope. Um, and I think the advantage of the Six Building Blocks program is it gives you sort of that continual opportunity to maintain the momentum and to figure out what your next steps are. So I'll shut up. Uh, I think that's that's great. And you touched on something that had come up in, in another question here, which is 
what is the key to engaging clinicians in doing this work? And I suspect the emphasis there is on work. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think uh, to underscore really what Dr. Parchman has just said, and, and, uh, and, I, and I'm seeing this in the work that I'm doing right now with a, with a group, and that is um, it is really important to involve the, um, the, the, the clinicians, to involve the providers. Um, the, um, the hospital with whom we're working now established um, a pilot um, group, and um, and, it, and, there, and the pilot involves um, three, three of the five individuals from the pilot group are, are providers, um, <clears throat> and uh, a primary care physician. You, it's really important to have a primary care physician who's really a, a champion, who embraces the, the, the goals of, of moving in this direction. Um, and is um, is going to really be a, 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 a you know a, a cheerleader for his or her peers. Um, and interestingly, the group that I'm working with right now, uh, they they have a they have a pain management program, and they have a, a, a mid level practitioner who runs that program. And that individual is uh, on their um, on their um, pilot implementation team, and uh, and so that's been. A, and then also they have uh, someone from behavioral health. So they have really taken a holistic and integrated approach, uh, which which is I think just ideal. And they are really going to um, and are taking the lead on beginning to have some of these discussions that Dr. Parchman mentioned, and are um, going to formulate recommendations to then take to their to their peers to the rest of the um, providers uh, for um, adoption and that process just, seems to be working well I'll just I'll just add and, to that oh, I'm sorry go ahead no, no, you, no, go ahead. Gonna mention, as, as you as it has been said before um, the uh, the benefit that comes from this actually reduces some of the stress within the, the, the clinicians, which is in, in its own way um, engaging and that they see that it's beneficial to their clinic. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had one clinic where there was one very disengaged clinician and he just wasn't I mean, he just wasn't buying all this. Um, uh, and of course he had a lot of patients on opioids. Um, but it was driving the staff nuts. Um, and so the staff took it on and just said, well, we don't care where Dr. So-and-so says, we're going to do this work anyway. <laughs> and they kind of, they kind of did it with him, with or without him, they did the work. And he, he came around. I mean, over time, he started saying, oh, yeah, okay, I can see how this is going to improve my life as well. <laughs> and so he began engaging and doing the work. Um, and I think that points out that, that getting, getting physicians engaged in doing this work You'll notice that none of the six building blocks are number one, do CME and educate providers, right? None of them. <laughs> um, because you don't change provider behavior with CME. Um, you, you know, it's not enough to present me, ev present me evidence, right? You have to change the structure in which uh, the, the setting where I'm delivering care supports me in doing the right thing at the right time for the right patient. Um, and that's what the six building blocks are. Um, is providing that structure and that guidance. Um, um, none of the six building blocks specifically say, just give them performance reports. Mm -hmm. Because we know that didn't change behavior, right? Um, the, 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 the aha moment for me was in a conversation I was having with a QI nurse, and nurses are the best at this, by the way, um, a QI nurse who told me, you know, it's not the data that changes physician behavior, it's the conversations about the data. Mm -hmm. I went, oh, that's right. You can give me all the data you want with emails and attachments, and I'll go, yeah, 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 I don't believe it, right? Um, but if you, but if there's a conversation going on in which there are other of my peers in the room in which my data is being talked about compared to their data, you can pretty darn be guaranteed that I'm going to sit up and pay attention, right? Yeah. And I'm going to be engaged. And the third thing I'll say is no data without stories and no stories without data. 
and bringing in stories of patients in the clinic, both patients who've been harmed and patients who've benefited by doing this work is really important because if it's a patient in my clinic that's been harmed by long-term opioids, whether or not I prescribed it or one of my colleagues prescribed it, I'll sit up and take notice because I don't want to be that clinician who has a patient who was harmed by long-term opioid use. So I think stories, patient stories are also critical. And, and that's, that's, that's embedded in, in some of the work we do with the six building blocks. So. Well, excellent. And we, uh, we are running short on time here, but we do have one more question, which is really, what are the biggest challenges associated with implementing this program? I know we've covered a lot of that in some of these before, but are there any other comments anyone would like to add on that? I, I think the biggest, pro biggest challenge is making it a priority and setting aside the time to do the work. Um, um, that, that is usually what, I mean, there's just so many competing demands in primary care right now um, that, and, and that's why having a, this structure to it and, and, and having this kind of um, approach to saying, well, where are you and what do you want to do next and how can we support you in doing it? Um, for many clinics makes sense because it allows them to do it at a pace that's right for them, but it also presents them with an opportunity to have someone check in with them and say, how's it going? How can I help you? So there's an accountability there too, um, to making progress. But, you know, COVID-19, I mean, come on. Um, there are other priorities right now going on um, in primary care settings um, in doing this work. And so that, that for me has been the biggest challenge. But Luis, what do you think? Lindsay? L Lindsay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you, Michael. And I think, um, and how, I mean, how do you prioritize your time? And I think it, there's just so many conflicting things going on. We're trying to do vaccination clinics and um, we're setting, trying to prop up telehealth to make sure that we can reach our patients. Um, so how do you prioritize this? Um, we feel that, you know, this, this, subpopulation is is likely to increase um and so right. how can we set up those um th those in that infrastructure to be able to support that if this this population is going to increase um so yeah yeah i'll just tag on what lindsay says this is skating to where the puck is going to be after covid absolutely because it's going to be an after covid all right and that, that's what i would encourage you to think about I think that's right. And I think as we've already mentioned, I mean, the 21% the rise year over year just in, by June of 2020, I think just absolutely underscores the devastating impact that COVID has had on, on individuals and families, uh, which is being borne out by, um, by the, the suicide, the jump in suicide rates, as well as the overdose, overdoses and overdose deaths. So I think we're, we're really looking at critical needs uh, in, in the population across the country uh, coming, coming out from under COVID. Um, I did want to just say one other thing back to um, the question about challenges, and I touched on this earlier, but one of the things we would strongly recommend as you all think about this, if you take this back to your respective facilities, is again, um, just, you know, it's all about really prioritizing. It's committing time and resources to move along on that um, quality improvement path, but also to be realistic and to set priorities and know that if you identify 10 things to do, you aren't going to likely be able to do all 10 things at once, but what can you start, what then can build on, you know, each step then can build on, on the prior step. So we really encourage uh, folks to take that approach um, for, for uh, tackling this sort of an initiative. And I think with that, Benson, that brings us up to our uh, final moment. And I know you have a few closing uh, reminders and, and uh, up, uh, updates to share. Sure, thank you very much. We're coming up to the top of the hour and I wanna thank everyone for their time and encourage all of our attendees to respond to the survey that will be coming out shortly. So thank you very much.
And uh, we should add, I think my, uh, that Benson had said at the onset, but we will be sending out the recording of this um, presentation as well as the slides um, following uh, today's presentation to everyone who registered. Uh, so thank you so much for participating today, and we hope this has been helpful.